We're going to go live in about four seconds. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Welcome to AP Environmental Science Review with Mr. Smeeds, Apes versus Everyone. How are you doing today, Mr. Smeeds? I'm doing great. It's that time of year. Uh, we're about, what, 36 hours out from the exam. We're Tuesday at 8 a.m. So, you guys, this is, uh, this is officially it. You're sprinting down the home stretch here. Last minute crowd, the last minute gang is coming in strong. I saw them on your channel. Your YouTube channel is incredible. Let's talk about that for a minute um, because you know when I'm there, I see that there's just tons of information for me. In fact, let me share my screen real quick. Um, so I love this channel. What are the best things I can do on this channel if I'm cramming? Yeah, absolutely. Go over to the videos tab there. Uh -huh. uh, and what you're gonna see is if you sort by recency- well, First of all, I'm gonna see this thumbnail of you. Oh, um, yeah. Distracting me. Now I can't get a five on this exam. I got this hair. Anyway, sorry, you were saying? No, I mean, there are some court cases you need to know. So we had to bring in an official judge to make a ruling. So <laughs> you're going to see maybe math exam review. I mean, I don't know if there's bigger bang for your buck than that math exam review. So you can watch me try to calculate pi squared, something or another. There, now, the, the math on apes is actually really simple. But we have Steve, Heim Steve Heimler's editor at work here. Uh, so it's going to pop. It's going to zip you through 18 minutes. You're going to know all the math you need to know. And that's 13% of the exam. Wow. Where else can you cover 13% of your AP exam in 19 minutes? Well, but here's the problem with YouTube videos. We're, you're in one right now with me. Hooray. And by the way, as everyone's coming in, just say hi in the chat. Let us know. Um, where you're coming from and uh, how we can help you. But one thing that is a problem is you're just passively watching videos. So talk to me about this very exciting ultimate review packet thing that you have. What is the ultimate review packet? How long does it take me to get through this thing to and practice with some real problems? Yeah, absolutely. So the ultimate review packet is incredible. I mean, it is going to get you through the entire course in just under four and a half hours. So if you are truly hashtag, you know, last second gang, uh, John commented on, on one of my videos like yesterday, I think saying like, where are my, where are my last minute people at? And I was like, John, if there's three days to go, the last minute people don't know when the exam is yet. Like they're, they're, they're trickling in now. And then tomorrow night they will be out in force. So what those people might want to consider doing is buying the alternate review packet, committing four and a half hours to oh, digesting yeah. all 99 okay. topics and there you go amazing yeah and armando is saying that the urp ultimate review packet is the best so really definitely everyone check this out jordan what are you going to cover in our review right now right here on the marco learning youtube channel absolutely we're going to keep it light because i'm going live again from seven to eight tonight and i went live last night from seven to like nine twenty and i was running on fumes at the end um, I'm still not quite sure where we left off unit five, unit six, and there might be 13 units and eights at this point, you know, the feeling. Uh, so we're going to keep it light. What we're going to do is try to talk people back off that, that AP ledge of I'm, I'm doomed. And we're going to give some FRQ tips. So this session is going to focus on skills more than content. We're going to keep it light. And then we're going to go and hit the content hard from seven to eight. That's about all I have left in the tank. I'm not, I'm not a last minute gang you know, study until 1 a.m. I got to go to bed soon. So that's what we're going to do. It's tonight. past Mr. Smead's bedtime, everyone. All right. So Mr. Smead, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll be in the chat with everyone else. Excellent. Thank you so much for your introduction, John. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it is a blast to be prepping with you all here. Uh, as you know, we're on the Marco Learning YouTube channel. So thank you to John for that gracious introduction. And what we'll cover today, as I mentioned, would be top five study resources. So what I want to do is point you in the right direction for your studying and then remind you that tonight there's a live stream uh, that you can come to to learn units five through nine, mostly six through nine, a little bit of five. We'll do a little Q&A in this session. So I'll actually pull up uh, our chat here in a separate computer so I can get that going and answer questions you might have. And then we'll go through the top 10 terms that I think will come up on FRQs in some way, shape or form. Before we get into it, though, remember that you are not your exam score, so you have an opportunity to earn college credit, but you are not a failure if you don't. You are not less of a student or less of a scholar if you don't earn this credit, but you have an opportunity. So take a deep breath, 
if the giant ocean of the world with all of its salt and dissolved oxygen and nutrients and the thermal haline circulation, mixing it around, if that can become calm, then so can you. You can become calm and you can know this is an opportunity to earn college credit. It's not a referendum on you as a student, but we still have a day and a half. So let's take advantage of that opportunity and go in as prepared as we can. So as a reminder, if you're learning this info right now, it might be a little late, but it never hurts to remember, we're gonna have 80 multiple choice questions in 90 minutes, that's 60% of the exam. Three FRQs in 70 minutes, that's gonna be 40% of the exam. You have three different types of FRQs, design and investigation, analyze an environmental problem, and then analyze an environmental problem, but also with a calculation. So you will have to do some math. That's why I said, where else can you cover 13% of your APES exam or, or any exam I should say with 19 minutes in that video John showed you. I go over to my channel when this is done and check it out. Pro tip, if you really wanna push for that four or five, you're not last minute gang, you're like, I've been here from the jump. Make sure that you know your weakest FRQ. So what FRQ are you weakest on? And then watch the video that I have from last year that covers that FRQ. Again, you can find this on my channel. It'll say FRQ one, two, or three in the video title. And it will tell you how to make sure you maximize your points on that FRQ. Study smarter, not harder. So what are some great resources here? I'm gonna walk you through the five top 10 resources that I think five top 10 Okay, trust me, in my math review video, I'm a lot better at math than in that. I'm gonna walk you through the top five, one, two, three, four, five resources that I think can help you get ready to get a five or at least get that passing score. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we are studying again, smarter, not harder. So the other thing I wanna do though, because I haven't actually popped in is I wanna go to YouTube here on my other computer so I can actually interact with you guys and answer questions that you might have. So uh, I'm just pulling that up here in my separate stream. But the first uh, tip that I think is really important for you guys to be aware of is going to be the 2021 FRQ set. Oh, sorry. Um, apparently we can't use links while we're presenting live or apparently the links aren't actually there. So let's just search these up, as the kids say. Um, Apes FRQs though is what we would need. So if you go to Google and you search Apes FRQs, you're gonna find the 2021 FRQ sets. These are the single best thing uh, to review as you're getting ready for this exam. So these are really, really important resource to use. So I would open this up and if you haven't done this yet, I would actually write these FRQs with a 70 minute timer. 70 minutes is the time that you'll get on the exam. So you wanna make sure that you are uh, writing at the same pace that you'll need for the exam in May. Uh, and so I'd go through and I'd write these and then I would go back and I would self score with the scoring guidelines here. So I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna give too many spoilers here. So I don't wanna show the answers on the screen. We'll go over these in some of my later videos. But if you scroll down to the bottom, what's awesome here is you're gonna see all of the answers to all the questions. So you can give yourself a score, but also you can go see sample responses so that you can see how this was actually graded by a real grader. So you can look at student samples and see what score did this one get and why. This one got a nine, we can see why. This one got a five, we can see why. Um, so a really underrated uh, tip. The next thing you wanna make sure to do is check out the unit one through five uh, and the unit six through nine live stream. So the unit one through five live stream happened uh, last night and the unit six through nine one is happening tonight from seven to 8 p.m. If you hop over to my channel, uh, we'll make sure to get that in the chat for you so you know how to find that. Um, and so we will make sure that that gets posted in the chat again, but you can just head over there right at 7 p.m. for more review. Then the third really important resource I think that you should do, uh, you should take a look at is that math review video and the practice questions. So again, John showed you this already. You know where to find that if you go over to my YouTube channel. Um, that is going to take you through everything you need to know about math. Now I see a math question here. 
from Angelina. I get really confused with the info presented in a math multiple choice question. So how can you avoid using unnecessary info for the calculations? Unfortunately, there's no secret sort of formula or no like way to guarantee that you don't make a mistake here. Angela, the best thing I can recommend is practice, practice, practice. So if you uh, go over to uh, my YouTube channel, you go Smeads H YouTube, and you watch the math review video, I don't want to echo blast you guys by um, playing this for you. But if you go down in the video description, you're going to get a packet that has a bunch of extra practice questions. And then if you get the ultimate review packet, then you get the answer key to those questions. And so you can make sure that you're doing the math problems right. And so there's a math teacher in my school that has a, a sign under door. The only way to learn math is to do math. And so I hate to say, Angela, but there's no quick fix I can give you. There's no like rule or tip that can make sure you always get the right information. Practice, practice, practice. And there's not that much math on the exam. Um, I think Armando said percent change, population growth rate, rule of 70, primary productivity. Armando is somebody who I can tell has been following my TikTok channel. Uh, what do you call it? A channel account? I don't, I don't know. I'm too old to, to understand all the lingo, but he follows me on TikTok probably. He saw the video that I said, those are the four math formulas you need to know. So again, Angela, practice, practice, practice with the math. If you are down to the wire and you haven't really covered everything well, and you kind of need to throw up a Hail Mary and see what happens, the Unit 9 YouTube playlist on my channel would be a great way to go. So again, if you go over to my channel, um, what you're going to find is a playlist if you go into the playlist section. So we go into playlists, and if you look in here, uh, you're going to see a Unit 9 playlist somewhere if you keep going here's the unit nine playlist so if you click on this playlist uh you're going to find all the videos that you need for unit nine and it's 15 to 20 percent of the exam uh, that's a huge chunk and so that's a really really important thing um for you to be all right be quiet uh, for you to be studying and so i would really recommend checking out that unit nine playlist um then if you look at the ultimate review pack, we already talked about that, so I don't need to go into that again. But if you are in this last second cramming mode, the ultimate review pack is going to take you through all 99 topics in four and a half hours. I can't possibly do it faster than that or better than that in my live streams because I sat down and planned all of those videos. We had the editor from uh, Heimler's History, awesome editor, went through and made this just crisp, fast, well edited videos with tons of visuals it's going to pop it's going to zip and you're going to get through everything you need to know in four and a half hours so i can't guarantee you're going to get you know four or five if that's the only thing you do but it will cover pretty much everything you need to know in four and a half hours really great resource to check out if you're looking for a review resource let's get into the top 10 now vocab terms that i think could be on this year's frq section things where it helps if you know the ins and outs of them and we have uh, about 15 minutes left, so that's perfect. We'll do about a minute per term, and then that will still give us a few minutes for Q&A at the end if people have questions that they wanna ask. And then we'll wrap up, and I'll see everybody again in about half an hour over on my channel for that 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, stream. So primary productivity, it is the rate of photosynthesis. Think about it as like your paycheck, your pay rate, okay? So when you go to your job, they don't say, we're going to pay you $200. They tell you a rate, right? They say, we're going to pay you $11 per hour or $12 per hour. They give you a rate. So they don't just tell you a lump sum. Plants are the same way. They have a rate of photosynthesis. So they're going to take sunlight in and they're going to convert it to sugar or biomass uh, over a given period of time in a given area. So you might say kilocalories per meter squared per year. What students get wrong is they a lot of times think it's just photosynthesis, but it's not photosynthesis. Every area will do photosynthesis and will do a large amount of photosynthesis if given infinite amount of time, but it's the rate of photosynthesis. How rapidly is photosynthesis happening per a given unit of area? So there is primary productivity. Biodiversity. Everybody knows roughly that biodiversity is good. It's like means something about there's lots of different animals and plants in an area. But if you know the three levels, which is genetic, ecosystem, and species, now you can write your FRQs at a little higher level. 
So the mistake students often make is not specifying one of the three levels of biodiversity. They just say, you know, high biodiversity is good, but why is it good? Genetic biodiversity, for example, protects a population from extinction because it gives a higher chance that at least some of the members can survive and pass on their genes. Same thing with lots of species in an ecosystem. If there's many species, high species richness, then you have a more stable food web. Taking out one species doesn't cause the whole ecosystem to collapse. It's diversified. All right, I'm going to go to ecosystem services. The big mistake you don't want to make here is forgetting that ecosystem services have to come back to money, so monetary value for humans. These are things or processes that natural ecosystems do that benefit humans monetarily. So you have to connect it back to profit or sales or revenue or saving us money. And what students do wrong sometimes is they mix up ecosystem services with ecosystem functions. So it'll say, what's an ecological function of a wetland or something? And you need to say something the ecosystem is doing if it's an ecological function. But if it's an ecosystem service, think money, think absorption of excess stormwater, protection of human property from being flooded. That saves us money. It's an ecosystem service. And then we get the soil erosion. Soil erosion is really important. It's the movement of soil. So we don't want to confuse it with weathering. Weathering is the physical breakdown of rock. So it's rock being snapped or broken by either ice freezing in its cracks and expanding or the wind and the rain breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. But then erosion is the transport of those pieces. So the wind and the rain blow those pieces to somewhere else. And that's a problem if you're a farmer or if you're an organism that lives in the soil or if you're a plant, because when you lose the soil from one ecosystem, it gets transported to another. You lose nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, organic matter that release more nutrients. And again, what students get wrong is they know it's bad. Everybody knows soil erosion is going to be harmful for farmers. It's going to remove nutrients, decrease yields. But what students get wrong is forgetting that you can decrease erosion by stabilizing the soil with plant roots. So if you keep cover crops in the soil or you plant more trees instead of clear cutting, you anchor the soil. That phrase anchor or stabilize, that's a really important phrase on an FRQ. Anchor the soil, stabilize the soil with plants roots. That's how you prevent erosion. Fertilizers and pesticides. Students mix these up. I don't know why. I think it's because they're both like chemicals that are put on agricultural fields, but the words are totally different. Fertile means like to grow and to reproduce. So a fertilizer helps plants grow and reproduce. It's gonna have nitrate or phosphate or ammonia or some other compound that contains nitrogen or phosphorus or a key plant nutrient. Pesticides are the opposite of fertilizers. Fertile, grow, reproduce, pest, organism you don't want is side to kill. So pesticides kill, fertilizers grow. Very different. They're both used in agriculture. They both help produce bigger, stronger, healthier plants that make more profit. Very different though. And so just don't mix them up. <coughs> Darn. You look at fossil fuels. Uh, what are fossil fuels? They're organic matter that remains after millions of years of being compressed by overlying rock layers or water. It's going to be coal, natural gas, or oil. And the key here is that they take millions and millions of years to form, which means they are not going to be readily available again in, you know, 100 years or 50 years. It's going to take forever. They're going to take way longer to form than they take to burn. That's a problem. That means they're finite. They're going to run out eventually. So what do students get wrong about this? They don't specify sometimes which of the three fossil fuels they're talking about because they're not all the same. So typically to produce electricity, we're burning coal or natural gas. It's pretty rare that we'd burn oil. It can be done, but it's not really common. Or they might not be precise about what they're saying the outcome is, like fossil fuel burning leads to air pollution. We don't just say air pollution, specify a pollutant like particulate matter or SOx or NOx or carbon dioxide adding to climate change. So specify a fossil fuel, know the differences between the three, coal, oil, natural gas. And if you need to review that, 6.5 is the topic for this video. And that would be a great thing to review. Um, ozone and smog are really important. 
they're important because they tie in a lot of different concepts. They tie in primary pollutants, secondary pollutants. They tie in, you know, protection of humans by the stratospheric ozone layer, but then the damaging of our lungs and the formation of, of uh, smog down in the troposphere, if we're talking about tropospheric ozone. And so it's really critical that you know these formulas. Um, so if you have NO2, NOx, going into the atmosphere, sunlight's going to hit it, break it down into NO and a free oxygen. And then you're going to add that oxygen to an oxygen molecule, O2, and that's how you get ozone in the troposphere. And that's bad. We don't want ozone in the troposphere. It damages our lungs, but it also is a precursor to photochemical smog. So it combines with uh, photochemical oxidants that get formed from Vox and nitrous oxide. And that's going to be a problem. It's going to be this thick clog, you know, clogged up airway, uh, decreased sunlight, decreased photosynthesis, and damage human lungs. Then if we have um, UV radiation in the equation, now we're talking up in the stratosphere and ozone is actually absorbing UV radiation and protecting us. So be helpful to know these chemical formulas here. Um, and then we have, just want to clarify real quick in the chat, top, top, tropospheric ozone is good, right? No, tropospheric ozone is bad. So in the stratosphere, I think S for saves. Stratospheric ozone way up above, you know, Earth's surface saves us from the sun. It absorbs UV radiation. And that prevents us from suffering, you know, damage to our skin, cancer, cataracts, things like that. But down in the troposphere, it gets in our lungs, damages our lungs, and it can damage um, plant food. So plants, like the one right behind me, could have their stomata, their pore openings damaged by UV radiation. I'm sorry, not UV radiation, um, ozone. All right, on we go to eutrophication, the most misunderstood, or I should say misapplied terminates. So eutrophication comes from excess nitrogen inputs into a body of water, usually from fertilizer runoff or CAFA waste, so animal manure, or untreated or poorly treated sewage, human waste that has nutrients getting into the water. The trick is eutrophication is just that, excess nutrients. It's not technically the algae bloom. The algae bloom is a result of eutrophication. So then you get a big algae bloom. The algae bloom not only blocks the sun by covering the surface, but when those algae die, because they, they bloom way over their carrying capacity, go back to topic 3.4, back to unit three with population, the algae bloom way over their carrying capacity, they die, and now bacteria are going to break them down. They're going to digest them in the water, and that's aerobic decomposition. Air for requires oxygen decomposition for breaking down of those dead algae. The algae get broken down by those bacteria in the water. Now we have hypoxia. Hypo for low, ox for oxygen, IA for a condition that an organism suffers. And so there's less O2, there's hypoxia, there's a dead zone. And this is why eutrophication is so bad. What do students miss? They forget that the decrease in oxygen is actually due to that aerobic decomposition. That's a pro tip if you want to be from that more like that four to five range, really understand at a deep level why eutrophication causes those dead zones and that hypoxia. All right, topic number nine, very, very important. Uh, so why is this important? Well, without the greenhouse effect or without greenhouse gases, Earth would be so cold that it would be freezing. Water wouldn't even be liquid at, at surface temperature. So we need the greenhouse effect to trap uh, infrared radiation, which is a fancy word for heat. And that traps it and radiates it back down towards Earth's surface. The problem is that we depend on a really delicate balance of greenhouse gases and a really delicate temperature. So when we add more greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs, when we add more of those, we increase global climate. And therefore, we also rise sea level or lead to a raise in sea level because the hotter the water and the hotter the atmosphere, the hotter the water gets, heat transfers back and forth between both. That leads to thermal expansion, so the water takes up more space and sea level rises. What students get wrong is mixing up greenhouse gases with pollutants. So don't mix up greenhouse gases and pollutants. Pollutants are different. They damage our lungs. They're bad for organisms to breathe in. CO2 isn't an air pollutant from a breathability standpoint. On an ACE exam, CO2 is typically not accepted as an air pollutant. 
So if you're asked for an air pollutant, go with something like particulate matter, NOx or SOx, or carbon monoxide that damages human lungs or other structures when we breathe it. Big difference. Water vapor is kind of an interesting one. This is another like pro tip, four to five range. It's a greenhouse gas by definition. It traps heat in our atmosphere, but it cycles so quickly. It has a short residence time. We're not really concerned about it. It's not really going to add to, you know, global temperature change. All right. Um, so on we go to uh, the final topic here, which is ocean acidification. So this is a decrease in the average pH of the ocean due to carbon dioxide going into the ocean. And that is going to lead to ocean acidification. And so as CO2 goes in the ocean, CO2 and H2O mix, and that's going to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is going to dissociate and give off an H plus ion. That's going to bind with the carbonate that calcium carbonate shell builders like coral need, and therefore their shells break down. So again, one more time, H2O from the atmosphere goes into the water. It combines with H2O of the ocean. We get carbonic acid, H2CO3, and that acid is going to give off an H plus ion, and that's what makes the ocean acidic. That H plus ion binds with the carbonate ion that calcium carbonate building shells need, or organisms that build those shells, coral. Uh, mollusks, they need that. And so what do students get wrong? They mix up sometimes warming and acidification. So make sure you know there are different things that warming is different from acidification and that it's caused by CO2 going into the water, not just the temperature raising. All right, so we can wrap up with a couple questions. Uh, we don't have tons of time for questions. Uh, we need to go on to our next live stream, uh, which is actually in, in half an hour. So there's a little bit of a break between like now and then. Um, and so in that break, it might be great idea you to watch a math review. Uh, John just popped the link there in the chat. So go ahead and click that link and mark uh, waiting for the next uh, live stream. I need a little break in between because... I'm getting old, you guys, and 30 minutes is a long time, uh, and an hour and a half is even longer to just talk. I don't know if John probably experiences this teaching. It's like we have our students do a lot of the talking. We get a lot of case studies and labs and all those things. So hour and a half lectures, two-hour live streams really take it out of me. So we're going to take a break here shortly. But, yeah, I'm actually approaching 75. But, hey, when you're a vegan and you just eat plants, People can't tell how old you are. It's the elixir of life. Um, so I'll take a question or two before I take a quick break, but then I'll hopefully see all you guys in half an hour uh, and we'll be doing a little more prepping over there. Um, so let's just check in quickly with a question from Ankita. Um, so on FRQ, we should not say CO2 is an air pollutant. What's the difference between greenhouse gas and air pollutant? Great question. Let's go back. Um, there's a big difference. A greenhouse gas traps heat. Uh, and so let me just show you really quickly what I mean by that. Greenhouse gas. So if we look at this image. This is one of the best images when it comes to um, understanding the greenhouse effect. So here's a great diagram of greenhouse gases. They trap heat. So infrared radiation, these red uh, squiggly lines hit those gases and they're bounced back down towards Earth. This is going to warm up the planet. Methane, water vapor, CO2, um, nitrous oxide is missing from this list. So with CFC, but those are all greenhouse gases. An air pollutant, on the other hand, is different. An air pollutant is going to be something that gets into your lungs and causes damage or mixes with other pollutants and causes acid rain or uh, damage to plant tissue, some sort of acute problem for a living thing. Climate change obviously is problematic for living things, but it's slow, it's indirect. And so CO2 is not an air pollutant. So don't write about CO2 as an air pollutant on an FRQ. Pick particulate matter, NOx, SOx, or carbon monoxide. All right, um, we are gonna move on. Unfortunately, uh, daily dose of disappointment. Sorry to disappoint you um, yet again, or maybe this is your daily dose of disappointment, but. The Soil Horizons, go uh, in this in this intermission now, go watch uh, 4.3. Go Google Apes, Smeeds Apes 4.2, 4.3. You'll find the soil video. 
And uh, we also have a question in AP Classroom, how do you analyze demographic transition? Google Smeads Apes 3.9, and you'll find those videos. It'll be something for you to do in the next half hour, and then I'll see you guys at seven. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, but like I said, we're going to take a break and I will see all of you.